Hello, everyone, and welcome to Ventures, a show where my guests and I get to explore entrepreneurial stories, market landscapes, problem spaces, and examine together how new ventures might be able to be created, either for-profit, non-profit, or personal ventures, to benefit humanity. Really, the purpose of this show is to educate and inspire a new generation of venture builders and venture investors to make the world a better place. In today's episode, my guest is Amari Salisbury. He is an experienced entrepreneur in the media space. He's launched media outlets in the Middle East and in Africa, and more recently, he's launched Converge Media in Seattle in the Pacific Northwest of the United States. And there he's uplifting voices. He is extremely well respected by people in all different points of the political spectrum. And we talked today about how he, he manages to pull that off, why he's interested in the truth and, and hearing perspectives that are different than his. And really it's admirable for all of us. So we, we talk about how uh, those of us listening to the conversation can actively participate and, and really help change the narrative around a number of topics, not just race, but uh, a lot of the biases and isms that we hold on to that, that we need to collectively figure out how to change. So if you are listening to this episode, you can also watch by visiting wclittle.com and there you'll see more extensive notes about what we talk about today. And if you're watching, you can listen anywhere that you get your podcasts. You can just search for ventures. So at the end of this episode, Amari and I talk about a campaign of Converge Media called No Excuses. Specifically, if you go to noexcusesjobs.com, you'll see there a a joint venture between Converge Media and my company, Proto Ventures, where we are attempting to help even the playing field to allow access to people to get jobs that they wouldn't normally have access to. And this platform allows short video-based resumes to allow employers to better understand uh, potential applicants for jobs that they have open. So with that, please enjoy this conversation with Amari Salisbury. All right, Amari, welcome to the show. Man, well, good. I, thank you. I appreciate being here. And I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. Absolutely, it's it's an honor. So why don't we why don't we begin by those that don't necessarily know you yet? Tell us tell us a little bit about your your background, a little bit about your story. Right. Well, okay. So my name is Omari Salisbury. I'm the founder of Converge Media um, from Seattle, Washington, where I'm talking to you from here today, in the Central District of Seattle. I'd like to say that our legacy black neighborhood there through my journeys um, from Seattle, did did college radio at at Elizabeth city state university in North Carolina, Uh, some label work for some record labels in New York and a few different TV networks. And then from that one overseas and spent, you know, a good portion of my career working across the continent of Africa and the middle East and in media and communications a few years ago, came back. I was living in Abu Dhabi, the United Arab Emirates. Came back home to Seattle and started Converge Media, which was just you know slow by slow. But you know, it's the thing. It's the grind when you build something. You work towards something. You just work at it every day. And we work work at it every day, creating content, and doing shows, and everything else. And um, You know, we were a company that was that always been covering stories that impacted the black community in Seattle. And so when I I guess nationally, they call it the George Floyd protest. So we'll we'll just run with that. Came here to Seattle, went to cover cover the protests on behalf of our community. And it turns out that, man, not only our, our neighborhood or our community, but the city and the state and the nation and internationally, people ended up liking Converge Media's coverage. Um, and the, the in-depth coverage that we offered. And now Converge Media is, is kind of out there. And it's interesting because locally and nationally and even internationally, we're, we're considered uh, a fair media um, and news source about issues in Seattle. That's great. So this show is about entrepreneurship. A lot of mm. listening in, watching. Turn my hat backwards for that. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Where did you, 
where, where did you know early in life or, or maybe later in life that you that entrepreneurship was was in your blood? I'll be honest with you. So 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 for me, as a little itty bitty kid, my mom and dad at the time, um, they they uh, traveled, launched Seattle's very first black owned photography studio, Salisbury Photography, almost fifty years ago. And as a young kid, I man, I grew up in the dark room, um, you know, developing photos with my dad, um, you know. And my, my mom was was in charge. It was in charge of sales. And the thing is, is right. I know a lot of the, the the young entrepreneurs who might be watching. They're like, "What? What are you saying?" But back then, before Google and all that, there was the yellow pages. So it was the yellow pages was business, and there was the white pages, which was residential. And if you didn't have your listing in the yellow pages before they went to print, you was out of luck for a whole year. And so my parents, they started Salisbury Photography. And, you know, by the time everything got in place, they missed the yellow pages. So they weren't in the yellow pages. Nobody, nobody, that that was it. Like, if you want to know if somebody exists, a business or whatever, you go to the yellow pages and figure it out. And so my mom would sit there and find all these innovative ways to be able to drive business. And she'd go through the white pages, which is the the, the residential, or she'd try to set up things or go to schools and try to, you know, get, get my dad gigs as me and like the, you know, the school photographer and some of everything else. And so as a small kid, my parents was hustling and bustling, you know, around their, their collective vision or dream. Now my, my, my parents ended up getting divorced. My dad moved to the East coast, but my mom went back to school and she walked to school from the central district to Seattle central college. And she was the first black, a uh, black person to have, a black woman to have an optician degree. You know, there's optician, a blow an optometrist is an optician. And she went and, you know, it was, it was us four boys out here and she was trying to do her thing. And, you know, it was, didn't nobody want to hire no black woman optician. Four kids, you know what I'm saying? And everything else. And my mom ended up starting eye care service. Eye care service. Year, years and years ago, and it was it was such a, a prede- uh, predecessor, I guess you would say, is eye care service was delivering um, uh, uh, eyeglass service to, to homebound people or people in nursing homes. Because, you know, once you're a nurse, you still need your eyeglasses adjusted. You still need to go and get fitted. You still need to whatever. Your glasses break. You need a new pair. And so my mom went up and down Western Washington, driving hundreds of miles every day, going to nursing homes and in and, and, and individual homes between Vancouver, Canada and Vancouver, Washington for years, delivering. She was the eyeglass lady. And she would go in, in there. And I guess that's probably why I got such an affinity and love for elders, by the way. Cause as a kid, I'd be in, I'd be in the car sometimes, man. My mom go to a nursing home. She have to go in there. She make an adjustment on some glasses, and do all these kind of things and everything else. And so, for me, it's like you know, from my earliest memories, I remember being in the dark room during Salisbury photography, and I remember being there. My mom, eye care service, and actually back then, the the, the claim form to get paid was so long that was my you know what I'm saying that was my thing after I got there with homework I had to fill out help fill out the claim forms you know what I'm saying for payment uh, uh, for for my for my mom's business so I don't really have a memory of not being around entrepreneurship and, and you know and everything else I do have memories of my parents being like you need to go get a job um, but you know, I mean, this is just just what I always saw, and so I, I it never had to be drilled into me. Sometimes you see this stuff where people are like, "Oh, you can be an entrepreneur, you can make your own," and people need convincing. When you grow up in that, you're like, "Ah, yeah, I can go do this. I can go do that." And it's it's kind of you know, it's not a second thought. That's pretty amazing. So, as you were a teenager coming into the twenties. What kind of what kind of work did you find yourself doing, and kind of how how was the the entrepreneurial journeys mixed in there? Well, so I'll, I'll be honest with you. So from like from like high school into into early in the early twenties, 
it was well, actually so so most of most of that period because I you know I played college I played football in college scholarship this and that you know playing ball it wasn't so much on the business but then when I think about it now there was always the small things I remember in college so what I did is back then you know what I'm saying I guess some old school maybe you old school too Will remember a thing called a CD you know what I'm saying <laughs> So, so what we do back then it was the mixtape, right? And so it was like it was a mixtape, and I remember back when the mixtape was actually a tape, but it was a mixtape. It was a CD, and I remember through college. I'm, this is a good question because at first I was gonna be like, no, I don't remember anything. But thinking about it, is yo, I remember I used to make the the mix CDs, and I I was you know I'm a, I'm a sucker for a love song, so. You came to Big O if you wanted the slow jams. Yeah, yeah. So you know what I'm saying? I'd have the slow jam CD, yo, and I had the burner. And you know, back then, th- these days, you understand about music and copyrights and all this kind of stuff. But you know, all those years ago and being in college, you didn't know about that. that. Maybe we just didn't want to know about it. But um, so I got this, this, I invested. You get a refund there from like your financial aid or whatever, and a lot of people you know you might go buy some new Jordans or something, or you might go do whatever, take your girl out on a super uh, date. I invested in a CD burner, mm. and, and I was like, <clears throat> because you know, I mean, at that point, my parents were like, man, you know, I mean, they just didn't have a lot of resources, and it wasn't one of these things where I could just call them up and be like, yo, what's up with this? What's up with that? I had to figure it out. So I was like, any money that I get just needs to make more money. And I just want to preface that, Will, that it's not like, it's not like, oh, okay, well, man, I've read this book by so-and-so and and Warren Buffett said X, Y, and Z. And I only say that to say that, like, man, you don't have to be like graduate level or whatever, just to just bring it down to a basic understanding that if you got a little bit of money, and it don't always work. You can't beat yourself up. Sometimes there is just nothing. Man, maybe maybe that great meal is just what it is. But sometimes it's like, I got this amount of money. What can I possibly do to at least maintain this money or be able to build upon it, right? So I took that money that, that I got. It was like a few hundred bucks from college refund check. Bought a CD burner. Buy some funny back then. It was a sticker you could print and print the sticker and put it on there. It came out with my mixtapes, man. And you know, in college, everybody wants to be Romeo. People love love songs. And I go and move my love song CDs. You know what I'm saying? Five dollars, seven dollars. Maybe somebody I don't like, but they they talking to the girl I wanted to date. So yeah, it's twenty dollars for you. <laughs> but but you know, I mean, and so you know, it was these these small things there, and then also. The, the Outer Banks of North Carolina, people might have heard of Kitty Hawk or, or Hatteras, North Carolina. Um, you know, those are those are very expensive homes out there. But the people who clean the homes, you know, it was, a, it, it was a black woman there in Elizabeth City where I went to school. And, you know, she I went out there. I went out there to Kitty Hawk in the Hatteras on the weekends. And I went out there and I cleaned houses, mm. you know, and that wasn't something that somebody would think that a football player and a this and that would be out there doing. But it was just like, man, you know, I got responsibilities. And, you know, I'm not – one thing that was important is my mama said that, that all legal work is noble. You know what I'm saying? So I wasn't above going and, and cleaning a bathroom or cleaning a house somewhere, you know, these resort towns in coastal North Carolina. So, yeah, I, I stayed in the mix one way or another. So then where where did the world of media then enter your life? Well, okay, so the thing is, so back in high school, you know, I was I was writing for the school paper, which is the the Garfield Messenger, always a big shout out, James A. Garfield High School. Yeah. And um, you know, I I I was always vocal. My mom would take me to all these meetings and public public hearings and this and that or this politics man she would tell me you need to go say something I'm like man I need to go talk I need to you know here's the mayor tell the mayor how you feel you're like seven years old you know what I'm saying so um you know but by the time that I got to high school and the college one way or another a big part of media at least being on camera or being on podcast or being heard is getting over being able to speak to people comfortably but um when I was in college there as well in North Carolina, I 
You asked, so I'll give you a short segue here. I actually got a degree in geology and a minor in environmental science, but, and I worked in an environmental research lab there in coastal Carolina. But so while I'm in school, I'm doing this lead test uh, and it's manufactured by a company in Colorado. And I'm doing the lead test and the results just keep coming off wrong. And I'm like, man, I don't know. I think the test is bad. And my professor, Dr. Maurice Powers said, man, you need to go up there to Colorado and run the test in their facility. And, you know, let's see what happens. So I go there from little itty bitty town in North Carolina up there to, to, to in the Colorado to this huge facility there. And there's all these scientists around me and lab coats and everything. And it's just me. And, and anyway, we go through it and it turns out that their test was flawed, right? So I come back to, 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 to Elizabeth City and the chancellor wants to bring me on the radio. He's like, man, we got to tell the whole campus about this. I'm like, yeah, okay. Sounds good to me. I'd be able to sell some more mixtapes. So it, I get on I get on air and the chancellor's interviewing me. And the, the station manager, Edith Thorpe, comes in there and is like, man, who? You. You need to be on radio. I was like, who, me? I'm a geologist. You're tripping. <laughs> you know, I was like, I'm going to go study some rock. And she was like, no, you need to be on radio. And so it was just happenstance. Like, I always had an affinity for media and this and that. And, and you know, I used to do, like, play-by-play of the, the football games, basketball games. But she was like, you need to be on air. And, I mean, that was one of the things that was pivotal. It was a change the direction of my life. Because although I ended up graduating with a degree in geology and environmental science, I spent a lot of time in radio and TV while I was in school. And even after I graduated, I stayed after it. And it really launched a whole nother career. But it, it's crazy. Oddly enough, you know, lead testing in the dismal swamp of North Carolina ended me up on radio for a station manager to hear me to be like, voila, here I am today. Gotcha. So how, so how did you end up doing radio and media in, in Africa and the Middle East? Man, so this this is interesting. This is like, this is a real interesting story. So, you know, I, man, I, I leave college. I got some great jobs, worked with AM1, worked with, with Universal, worked with the, the College Network, a lot of different stuff. And so then I'm back in Seattle, for the most part, back in Seattle. I'm doing some stuff down in Mexico as well. I'm working with some brands there. I meet a guy from Tanzania. And he knew that I had this history of going to these, working with these media and record labels and stuff. And he was like, man, I'm trying to bring Ja Rule to Tanzania. And now, you know, I mean, people like, ah, Ja Rule, he's at Ja Rule back in the day. And Ja Rule had jams. Ja Rule and Ashanti, what? Couldn't tell me nothing. And so it was like a year. He's like, oh, my brother, you know, we're good at Tanzania and this and that. I'm like, man, I don't know. I'm good. And at the time, I was living in, in like Mexico. I was going over to Colombia and Belize. I'm like, man, South America's good, bro. <laughs> and finally, a year later, man, we fly over there to Dar es Salaam, the Port of Peace, Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. And it only took me being there for like three days. And I was like, this is where I was always supposed to be. Um, and it was, it was very undeveloped. Still is, you know, compared to like, you know, that's what they call the developing world. But man, the people, the culture, the opportunity, everything, it just, it just popped out. And also I met all the big media dons, so to speak, that very first trip. I mean, like if I hadn't met people like Joseph Kusaga and some other people that's over there, big, big barons of media, who knows? I might've just came back home and been like, whatever. But it was like fate. I went over there, I met all the right people I needed to meet really in the first few days there. And I was like, man, I'm supposed to be here on the continent. I'm supposed to, to take everything that I know and come over here and really learn much more and, and try to make an impact. And Everybody thought I was crazy, which is interesting now because now, you know, Africa's in. Everybody wants to be in Africa, it's this and that, you know what I'm saying? From the clothing design to the dancing to the whatever, to content, you know, Africa's in. But, you know, 15, 16 years ago, people laugh at me. You know what I'm saying? You want to go where? You want, you want to Africa. 
what you gonna go there for? What, you feed the children? You know what I'm saying? I'm like, nah, man. You know what I'm saying? And it's it, it's people people because we saw it here in our own eyes in America, and because a lot of stuff was already bought up by big corporations or whatever. Um, like eight, you gotta imagine like AT and T. American Telephone and Telegraph goes back a hundred some odd years, right? So this one company was there at every iteration of technology. Like, you know what I'm saying? From from the telegraph to the 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 telephone to mobile phone to internet. They've been in business that oh, they had a stake in that the whole time. But imagine going into a country where there are no stakeholders. You know what I'm saying? It's like, yo, here's this new takeover. Here's 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 our wireless spectrum. You know what I'm saying? We can have up to eight providers and eight different people are like, we're gonna get the cell phone business. Or man, you know what? The fiber optic cable is landing. We can have up to this many ISPs and people are like, man, I'm gonna go and be in the ISP business or radio frequencies. And that's the excitement in a developing market, man, because it's like you don't you don't see that here. You see an acquisition or a merger. But we've never really in real time, I mean, in some markets you have where you got like McCall Wireless and then went to Voice Stream, which went to T-Mobile, you know, and things like that. But in a broad sense, we never really seen that here. And so when you're overseas, you really see like when you talk about entrepreneurship, people in America don't have anything over people who are in developing countries. Mm. And and that's and it'd be funny because you know people are like you know those guys come over here from Samoa and then they just blow up or the guys from Ethiopia or the guys from you know Vietnam. If you knew how hard it was to make one nickel mm. in Tanzania, Somalia, or Vietnam, how hard like this, I've never worked so hard in my life as I did working across the continent of Africa. That's why when I come I came back here to America, this stuff is easy to me. I'm like, oh, word? Everything works? The lights, the internet, the road signs, this and that. And all I have to do is sit here at my desk for eight hours? <laughs> I'm winning. And, and people, people don't understand. It's a very hard environment. And, and the level of entrepreneurship and the commitment there. And that's why when people leave from these foreign countries and they come here to America and, and you came up in that very difficult work environment, and you come here to America and you're not faced with that and all you're really faced with is opportunity, that's why people come here and blow up. It isn't because people are like, oh, well, the system is built for them. There are some immigrants, so they get this special help. Nah, they just know, like, what? It was crazy where I came from. This is good. Let me thrive. Yeah, I'm sorry. I got a little bit away from your oh. question, but I was just like, you know, we, we sort of, we, we talk about worth at work ethic in entrepreneurship and, you know, you can sit around and pontificate all you want, but nah. you, if you have a life experience that, that, that forces you to have, have a higher degree of, of, of hustle than, than, than your typical American, then yeah, I see how that can, uh, that, that can be interesting when you, when you reach the States here. Yeah. I mean, so I, w I would tell you this, right. Is that, you know, I did all this media stuff, and so, so just to just to tell everybody watching and listening, man, I, you know, I I worked across eight different countries in Africa. I visited, probably worked in, well, I lived in about eight countries in Africa. I worked in about twenty five to twenty six altogether. Been in about almost sixty countries around the world. You know, what I'm saying from from launching TV stations, radio stations, big content deals, satellite providers, all kinds of stuff. I mean, you name it. I did it. I also spent a stint with, with Heineken, worked with, with uh, Moet Hennessy, marketing, communications. I came back, you know, couldn't get a job, right? Which was a whole nother story, <laughs> maybe a whole nother podcast. But the, the whole point is, is I came back home and I tell people this in entrepreneurship, the things you were passionate about, just because you don't have an easy entry into it, if it's your passion, keep doing it. And and I say that because it's like with Converge Media, like people know us, people like Chicago, people, people across America internationally, they know us, but they know us because 
It was when preparation met opportunity. And I say that to say this is like, <clears throat> while I was out there, did nobody want to hire me because my algorithm didn't match up with LinkedIn or whatever it is. I kept writing. As a writer, I put out my blog. Sometimes 20 people read it, 40 people read it. I kept writing. Doing podcasts like we're doing right now. I started, I started three, four different podcasts. It was all community stuff, how to overcome gentrification, this about business development. This, but every day I did something. You know what I'm saying? Every day, whether it was going to take pictures from the neighborhood, you know, just with my iPhone. And the other thing is, is using what you have to do, do what you can with what you have. You know, all I had was some, uh, was an iPhone. So I, I launched something big. It was just me and my iPhone, but I was like, yo, it's the camera phone collective. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I'm, I'm not going to limit my vision by the tool that I, this tool doesn't determine the scope of my vision. Right now, all I could afford and use, you know what I'm saying, was an iPhone. But that doesn't determine the circumference of my vision. So I'm like, yeah, it's just me and my iPhone. But I'm like, it's the camera phone collective. We come into a neighborhood near you to tell your story. It's just me and my iPhone. But it was all good because, you know, I also set the basis of expectation of the viewers. People knew this is O and his iPhone. So no one was expecting the the red camera and the this and that and everything else. And it's funny, I bring that up because years ago, three years ago, four years ago, there, there's lots of people in the community. Everybody in any sector knows this person. <clears throat> Man, they had the best cameras. They, they said the red cameras, the, the 5D cannons, the sound, the light, and here I am with my iPhone. And I'd be like, yo, man, can I borrow this? Can you, how can we collaborate? And they'd be like, nah. I'm good. I'm waiting for this, this, and that. I'm waiting, 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 waiting. Even though they had every tool. And I was just like, well, man, I ain't got no tools, but you know what? I'm not going to wait. And people were telling me like, well, you know, if you wait for this, I can I can connect you with my friend who has so-and-so who has this and that. Maybe they have a camera and a sound kit or whatever. And I'm like, nah, man, you know what? I'm going to just do what I can with what I have. And that iPhone, getting out there, just telling community stories, just telling small stories. And I edited on my phone, you know what I'm saying? Didn't really have no resources for no editing bay or no funny software, nothing. It was just on the phone because it was a passion, though. Yeah. It was like, man, I'm going to put something out every day. I'm going to put something out. It was a video, whether it was an article, whether it was a podcast, whether it was whatever, put it out every day because it was a passion and it didn't matter. You know, I mean, clearly in the back of your mind, you're like, well, I hope more than three people watch. I hope more than six people watch. But it's still, you know, I saw it as even though my, my viewership and everything wasn't where I wanted it to be. I was like, you know, the, the exact term I used to tell these guys is I was like, <clears throat> my, my friends, I'd be like, man, we're just in the gym. Mm. Right now, every episode I put, every article I put, we're in the gym. Don't worry. We're going to be ready when they call us into the game. You know what I'm saying? I tell guys, man, we're just lifting weights right now. We're in the weight room. Don't worry. And it, it's crazy. You know, I forgot about it. I'm so glad we had this conversation right now, Will, because I forgot. We used to say that. Mm. We used to be like, yo, we put out an episode, 50 people watch. Don't worry. We just still shooting in the gym. We're going to be ready when they call us up to the, to the league. We're going to be ready. And it's just crazy because this light bulb is going on in this conversation. When the Seattle protests occurred, that's when we got called up from the gym to the big league. And we was ready. And 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 we we've been out here, you know, ever since, um, you know, every day, just delivering. And that, man, wow, I'm I'm kind of blown away in this interview because I forgot that we used to say that. We'd be like, man, you know, 60 people watch this. And I'm, you know, I'm the leader out there. I'm like, man, don't worry about that. We go make. We're gonna make another one tomorrow. We might get sixty-three people. We're just in the gym. We gotta be ready for the call. And it was crazy because the call came in May, and we was ready for it. So one of the themes I'd love to explore is it's it's evident from reading, listening, and watching your work that you, you that you're different. That you are genuinely interested in people that you're interested in their perspective, you're interested in the truth. 
that is rare, unfortunately rare these days in, in media. What, what is it about, maybe, maybe, maybe something in, in the Middle East or Africa you learned about human beings, but I, I'm curious to explore where does that come from? Where, where does that drive to be genuinely curious about people and issues come from? Man, um, I mean, part of it, I think, probably comes from my parents and just, you know, always wanted to 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 ask questions, which is cool because, you know, they're both really religious, too. But they're super just ask what, what you know, figure, go figure this out and, and introduce to me to things, National Geographic and stuff like that when I was when I was young. But the bigger thing, though, in, in just keeping it here on the family side is beyond our parents the 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 thing that you can't you can't ever have an expectation to be a great storyteller if you're not a great listener and in our culture you know you go down south you be there big mama house you know grandma's house or whatever and as a youngster you knew that it was like i'm just here to listen it was all my my, my uncles are here my aunts are here and this and that and so when when you when you are already conditioned in a space to be like you know what the elders are speaking, let me see what I can learn, or these people are speaking, let me see what I can learn because you know so many people you know you see it all the time and say people are listening to reply and not to understand, but you know I was raised to listen to understand, and if I don't have anything to add to the conversation, it's okay to be quiet. You know what I'm saying? Because all these people are in, it's lots of conversations. You just sit and and just listen. And we we sit at the feet of our elders and things like that. And I mean, I've I've kind of taken that same approach into um, journalism craft. And that a lot of things. There's very few stories outside of the obvious. A buildings on fire. Why is it on fire? What happened? But it's very few stories that I go into with a predetermined disposition. You know, I might really be intrigued, like, mm, I don't know, this looks fishy. But because when you do, you realize that you don't give, you, you don't let people talk. You're not listening. You're just listening for what you want to hear instead of listening to everything. And so we, we've been able to kind of do well here and following that path of like, you know what, it's all right to just sit. And you listen, and when, when I'm talking about when I was over in Tanzania, my friend, when the village meets or the elders meet or whoever meets, it's almost like the Senate where it's unlimited time. And you got a circle there of like 40 or 50 people. You're going to be there for hours. You know, what, you know what I'm saying? There is nobody with no timer. And, and everything else, and you know, it's disrespect to get. Oh man, I gotta go. I gotta go watch, you know, the football game or whatever. And you sit there, and you sit and you listen, and and even listening. People, I think that that people forget that just listening is such a sign of acknowledgement and respect. And we're so disrespectful to each other in today's society because listening isn't a guarantee of agreement. I don't have to agree with you. You know what I'm saying? And so people almost make it, I'm not going to listen to that because of whatever. It's okay to listen because you, you, you're not committing the guarantee. You're not, you're not committing to, to, to agree. You're just committing to have a better understanding. And I just feel like, and it's been my thing on my, my social media for the most part for years, is like all things are possible through communication. Because we don't we don't have to agree, but we should make a commitment to understand. And in that understanding, a lot of things go a lot of ways, man. And so, yeah, I, I, I would say that's where my, my disposition comes from. It's just having a willingness to to want to listen and learn. And also, I just love to learn. I love to hear different perspectives. I love to hear. It was interesting. I got pushed back one time during the Seattle protest because the Proud Boys were up there in Capitol Hill. I'm like, well, it's the Proud Boys here. And this is back when the CHOP was still there for people who might remember the CHOP or you could Google CHOP Seattle. Um, and so the Proud Boys rolled through. And so, of course, it's the news because, you know, you never know. It's the Proud Boys, it's the protesters might get funky. 
And so I started, I put on my camera and I started just interviewing people. I'm like, Proud Boy, what's going on? You know, I was like, it was cool, cool. Because Proud Boys, by the way, are the only people who actually identify themselves. They wear a jersey. You know, everybody else, you just, you can't call them out. So I'm like, oh, okay, well, here's a Proud Boy. Here's this and that. I'm talking to them. All the comments. Oh, you're giving the Proud Boys a platform. Why are you talking to the white supremacists? Why are you talking to them? And I was like, for me, I want to know what brought you here. What do you hope to achieve? What are your understandings? How far apart from your ideology and the protesters' ideology do you, or, you know, are you really? Then I bump into this six five Samoan proud boy named Tiny, and he's probably good. He's very famous on Twitter, and I'm like, it's Samoan. I said, I thought all proud boys was white. I was like, no, all proud boys were multicultural, which is a whole other conversation, which blew my mind. But I didn't know, nor my viewers, and on top of that. The Proud Boys were providing security for a black woman preacher who came there to proselytize people in the chop. So now it went from, I could have never turned my camera on, there's the Proud Boys, to now here's the Proud Boys. I talked to the white guys. I learned now from Tiny that they're a multicultural organization. And then I meet the black woman, and people might know this story. There's the same black woman who was there in the chop. I interviewed her as well. Who, put, who kept putting paint on the Black Lives Matter mural there in New York City. There was a black woman who was, you know, who was arrested for that or whatever. That's the same woman that was there in Seattle. I interviewed her. I interviewed Tiny, who got arrested on federal charges for beating people up as a proud boy. And I interviewed these other people who were there. But it was, it was crazy, too, is because when the Black Lives, mural, black Lives Matter mural got defaced in New York and people were wondering who did it, when I saw her, I was able to go to my footage and I put it out there. We know this woman. You see what I'm saying? So people who tell you, don't talk to this person, don't talk to that person. Look, man, I'm going to talk to anybody and learn as much as I can. And I think that learning, whether in journalism or even entrepreneurship, when we talk about you don't have to agree because, you know, Gary V might say this and somebody else says that. It probably doesn't hurt you to listen. You don't have to agree. But you should listen to what people are trying to say out here. And you might even take bits and pieces and make something work for yourself. Yeah. So I feel like in the last 10 years, there's been, there's been these sort of meta waves in, in, in the conversation globally, but especially in the U.S. around sexuality, gender, and race. And from my perspective, it does not seem like a lot of people are listening, let alone learning, let alone actually changing. Obviously, this summer, your coverage you've been heavy, heavy into the, the, the conversation around race. How, 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 one, number one, do you listen? Like what goes through your mind when you're listening to people? But then two, how can we collectively as a community listen to, to actually learn about this conversation? Well, I think that when, when you talk about the conversation about like race, gender, and things like that, is that, being black, I never stopped listening. You know what I'm saying. So I have a different kind of perspective of of things. And let me let me give an example. Will is that it's funny because I get I get comments every week from people, mostly white people, really all white people. All the comments are coming from white people. I mean, is that they're mad because I'm not more angry at the police. And I'm not more angry at city council. I'm not more, you know, I'm almost being too fair and too generous and everything else. And for people that, that know about me and Converge Media, then you know what I'm talking about. For other people, you know, you could you look up on, on uh, do the searches through Omari and Converge Media, Seattle protests, and you'll see that it's like, you know, I was there covering this and got tear gassed every day. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And, and, and shot with, with, with the rubber bullets and flashbangs and targeted, like 100% targeted to throw flashbangs at your head, exploding, temporary hearing loss and all kinds of injuries to my staff. And people, you know, are just they're, they're outraged. They're like, man, I can't believe this and that. Or when these neighborhoods got tear gassed in Seattle, and it wasn't just the protesters. It was people in their apartment trying to feed their kids and they got tear gassed and all that. And it's amazing. And, you know, I don't want to say this in a, in a sarcastic way or anything, but it was like, there's all these white people who just now 
see the America that we've been living in. And I always tell them, and they're like, man, you should be doing it. I'm like, man, 30 years ago, 30, more than 30 years ago, I was beat up by the Seattle Police Department in that same precinct that people were protesting outside of here in Seattle in the East Precinct. You know, 30 years ago, right? And it was me and my brother, man, SPD was, woo, it was, man, it was a cold-blooded organization. And so then I get, I get a bunch of people who are like, you should be this, you should be that, you should be here. And I always tell them, hey, you're kind of late, but welcome to the party. Let me pour you a double, you know, because we've been out here dealing with this. We've been out, and I'm glad that other people are outraged and other people are whatever and all this and that. And I don't want someone to hear me talking now and think that I'm downplaying people's efforts and people, whatever. So a lot of people who are doing their part because of they might have, they really might have just been catalyzed when they saw George Floyd. That was, that was such a horrific crime against humanity. And that's okay. But just know that, like, for people like me, when you don't get a rise out of me on every single injustice or every single, uh, you see this tweet? Did you see this article? Did you see? I've been dealing with this my whole life. And a lot of Black people, we've just been dealing with this our whole life. This conversation never stopped for us. America as a country, every once in a while, something happens. And as a nation, it's like, we need to have this conversation. Rodney King. You know what I'm saying? Well, I guess, you know, when people have been saying for years, like, hey, the police are beating the crap out of people. No one believed them. Rodney King takes services. Oh, maybe they're telling the truth. Mm-hmm. You know, and then you have these conversations about about race and a conversation this and that. And so America takes time to pause, but you know, we don't have the luxury. Mm-hmm. Um and and I would I would just say this is that in a larger sense, and speaking to a larger population and demographic across the country of different backgrounds and, and uh, ethnic orientations or anything else, when we, when we have these, that it's like the worst thing that can also happen is where white people just disavow who they are and their story and everything else to be like, oh, I'm so ashamed of my whiteness of this. Man, that's just not helpful. You know what I'm saying? It's not like, I remember one time this woman came all the way from Tacoma. uh, So people might know it's about 40 miles away. She saw me on the street and she came and I'm covering the police. It was crazy. You know, it was protest. You know, it was a violent protest. And she said that she came to put her white body on the line for me, you know, drove 40 miles. I mean, so one, you know, of course, you know, you're like, man, this is, I appreciate that. No matter what, even if I don't really agree with her putting her body in, somebody get in the car and drive 40 miles, it's a commitment, you know. But this is the thing is, it's like, black people don't need that, you know. I mean, at least I'm going to say some people might say something different, but that woman who came to put her body on the line, she very well might be a bank loan officer. You know what I'm saying? I don't need you to come in there and jump in front of me while I'm filming. I need you the next time that somebody black come in there and trying to open a loan for their small business that you might give some, some deference. And that's what I'm saying is I don't, I don't want white people to sit there and dumb themselves, their influence down to just being like, well, man, I can go and carry a sign or I can put up a Black Lives Matter or I can do this and that. When you got, when you got all these white people who, who are controlling so many things, you know what I'm saying? Or a part of an ecosystem that, that black people, marginalized people are shut out. It's, it's so many small things that people can do. Like, like here in the city of Seattle, the, the 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 PTA at the black schools don't have no money. The PTAs at the white school do, so they are able to do all these kind of things. Something small somebody can do. Man, you ain't got to put a Black Lives Matter sign in your yard. Just find a way to donate to the PTA at Garfield High School or Rainier Beach High School. You see, you see what I'm saying? That's something that's tangible. You ain't got to be down there protesting in, 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 in front of the police when you can make some kind of commitment some you know somewhere in the process when i talked about me not being able to get a job and everything else you don't have to go out there and protest in march and everything else if you a hiring manager you might be like man let's let's reevaluate the way that we look at how people apply because maybe it's not fair maybe it's not equitable and so you know my call 
for 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 white people is man to thrive in the space that you're in and be more equitable and inclusive in that space. You ain't got to go down into the protest line. There's people who's there. Believe me, they're there. You don't have to go and, you know, if you get the Black Lives Matter sign good, just make sure you buy it for somebody black. You know what I'm saying? That's cool if you get that. But man, in the space that you're in, that you can most immediately impact, what is it that you're willing to do? What is it that you're willing to do that's going to make an impact, that's going to be sustainable change and everything else? Because believe me, if the only thing that you're willing to do is go protest and hold a sign, that's not sustainable. Get tired, this and that. Your wife's like, hey, you're gone too long. You know, baseball season starts, you're a coach. You're no longer out there to go be able to hold the sign. But if you're able to impact the hiring policies and practices of your whole business or organization, guess what? That's something sustainable. And that's something that's going to continue to make change even after you leave that company. Let's talk about DE&I for a minute. You know, diversity, equity, inclusion. I think our country, the world needs, needs some significant DE&I training. I've, I've, I've been, through, been through some of these trainings, uh, both by fire and by m- more traditional folks that come in and, and teach in a corporate environment. From your perspective, obviously this is, a, this is extremely complex and multifaceted issue, but from your perspective, seeing different cultures all around the world, seeing bias, seeing racism, seeing various flavors of racism, What's your general take in the sense of, it, are you hopeful for humanity around becoming aware and overcoming these biases? Or how, or how do you think about it? How do you think about it at night? Yeah, because you know what? The thing is, is ignorance and hate are both temporary conditions. You know what I'm saying? It's not a, it's not a permanent condition. We can come overcome to, uh, ignorance and we can overcome hate. I mean, even when somebody or someone is handicapped, you know, if someone has a, has a handicap, maybe you're maybe you're blind in the eye or something like that. Right now, we don't have the technology for you to overcome that. That's just something that's going to be. But for people to be ignorant and for people to be hateful, that's temporary, and and it's up to us. And you're right. And it's like I've experienced stuff in all all kinds of different countries. You know, when when I was in East Africa, you know, everybody was black. So when the police pulled you over, it wasn't because you were black, but ah. What what class are you in? Right. Uh, I, you're one of those Masaki guys. You must live in a big house over there. You have so much money. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> or it's because I was American. And it's funny because I tell my, my brothers and sisters here, especially from Latin America, I, as part of a lot of these forums, they're like, you don't know what it is to run from immigration and this. And I'm like, yeah, I did. All those years in Africa, man, working, working illegally. I tell people I snuck into more countries than most people will ever visit. You know, leaving and all these things. I've experienced all of that. And I would just say that here, man, it just comes down to people's want to. Mm-hmm. And what we have to understand the will, and this election shows it. And I can't, I'm not going to put all 72 million people who voted for, for President Trump into one bucket. But I just will say that there's tens of millions of people who they don't want to see that change. They don't want, and you gotta, you gotta remember. Just briefly here, let's just go through American history. Early, early on, you know, the founding fathers, these guys had it good. They're aristocrats, well educated, you know, nice wigs, you know, good clothes, all this kind of stuff. But they knew early on. They were like, man, all these people were coming over here to the America, to Britain. You know, it's a debtor colony. You know, bag of bombs, all kinds of stuff, man. You know what I'm saying? America in the early days, wow. You know what I'm saying? It was like the strip. There's some of everything there. Then you had the founding fathers. The founding fathers were like, look, man, if we let these jokers get every one man, one vote, then it's way more of these guys than us. So we have to find a way to suppress them. And that's why early on, man, you know, white people, even like white people should really jump on this suppression bandwagon because, you know, white men then. But even white men couldn't vote unless you owned land, went to school or something else, because they knew that if you let all the white men vote way back when, that the ignorant, uneducated white people outnumbered the founding fathers and it would take one election cycle and they'd be done. Right. And so, you know, electoral college, all this kind of stuff. Whole point that I'm that, that, that I'm leading up to here is throughout our history in, in, in America, there's been an element here. It's never left. 
that's tried to suppress, try to hold back, try to deny, try to some some everything else. You know what I'm saying? Whether it was poor white people, whether it were black folks, whether it was women, whether it was whatever. And you know, there's always been an element here in America as well. And was, uh, the unfortunate thing about America is is that it's been so wound up that poor white people will make moves against their best interests because they hate black people. You know, you know what I'm saying? Poor white people ain't that far off. You know what I'm saying? In a lot of cases, they worse off than black folks. These poor white people just go through Appalachia, go through some of these places, they'll make, they'll, they'll vote in their worst interest because it means that, well, at least by doing this, those niggas is gonna get hit. And they don't understand that we all in the same, we all in the same bucket. I bring that up because it's like until that gets addressed, until until you get these millions of people who one way or another, and, and people might think that, oh, you know, America's changing, America's this, this, and that. We took a step backwards from Obama. And that step that we took was that, you know, all of these people who had all of these emotions about race and everything else, and and all they they found they found fertile ground mm. in the last four years. And we realized that, you know what? We're not the country that we say we are. We're not the country that, that we aspire with. This isn't post-racial, whatever, whatever. It's not. And we see that right now. We saw that in Wayne County last night, where you saw that two, two, two people there on the Callison board was like, no, we're just not going to certify the election. I'm good. You know what I'm saying? Um, but all of that being said, Will, is man, it's my optimistic nature and everything else. It is like, man, these things can be overcome. These things, you know, our messaging needs to change. How we talk to people needs to change. A lot of a lot of other voices need to be heard and everything else. But the two things that are holding our country back is ignorance and hate, and those are not temporary conditions. So let's talk about converge. So you have have a vision mission creating a, a media platform to uplift voices. You find yourself in the middle of CHOP covering what was going on in, in, in the front lines during that season. Where, tell, tell us about Converge. Where, what, what is your vision and mission? And how, how, how are you going about getting after it? Well, you know, so for, for Converge, we started as a platform for... Um, Northwest, Northwest uh, United States um, content creators to be able to distribute and monetize content. And I got that from like being overseas, you know, we see the big platforms like uh, um, Netflix, but a lot of places overseas is hyper localized. You know what I'm saying? So you might go to a certain part of a country and they got a streaming platform that's just about their content from that part of the country. And it's an amazing catalog and it's all this stuff and they're getting you know, membership and subscribers and everything else. And what I thought of was like, man, the Northwest is always left behind. And what if I came home and created a platform that would allow for Northwest content creators, video, audio, podcasts, photos, to be able to, to you know, get their works out and really get seen. And, you know, first people are like, oh, well, I can get my own web page, my own YouTube. And then you come to find out, that's great. You got 32 views on your YouTube. And, and nobody's seen it and you know i mean and so that's why it's like the whole idea was okay we're going to do the marketing and promotion and we're going to leave the art the art to the artist um and be able to craft partnerships on a local level so that was the idea for convert um and you know a lot of people didn't buy in because they didn't really get the vision of it they were like well there's youtube there's this i'm like okay you know what i'm saying and so, um, you know, we just started making our own content, our own morning show, our own public interest show, our own this and that or whatever. And then that was going into the protests. And then of course there was all, all this protest live coverage and our morning update show continues. But for Converge, when, when you say the, the future of Converge, I mean, our, our goal was to really be able to tell the story of, of, of black people and, and people of color, I guess you would say, in the urban, that urban ecosystem across the Pacific Northwest. Um, right now, I, we, we definitely have a good hold or stronghold, I'd say, I'd say in Seattle, Seattle metro area. So we wanna be able to grow in into our vision. And our vision really is that, 
you know, Seattle, Portland, um, the Inland Empire, and that's, you know, places like Spokane and up north Vancouver, Anchorage. Um, and we want to be able to tell these stories um, that are out there, be able to create a platform for it and everything else. We've also got our Converge Music, though, which I'm really excited about, you know, background and music and everything else. And um, we're doing every, because these musicians, like a lot of other industries, they're just getting beat up right now because of COVID. And we're doing our very best to use what we have to to highlight um, artists, to do live streams so people can donate, all these other things. But Converge Music is emerging because I really feel that we 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 have, that's a space for us, man. That's content creation. And also right now it's, it's interesting because we ain't got much will, but what we have, we're investing in the arts mm-hmm. out here in, in Seattle. And it's interesting because there's a there's a lot of other media organizations that are really thriving right now. You know what I'm saying? And I'm not being judgmental, but I'm just saying that this is this is kind of the things that sets Converge apart is that with our limited resources, we're investing in people in our community who have less. And, and highlighting them and, and trying to uphold them. And, you know, uh, artists, Seattle artists, and especially recording artists are people who need our help. And so we've got this whole converged music effort going to be able to try to, to raise awareness and, and funds for artists. Um, big picture, people are like, oh, you know, you need to go do this and you should go and on this network and go on that network. And... I'm appreciative of that kind of talk because that that tells me that people see me as you know in a in a higher higher level. But on the flip side of that is is that man, I come from that world. You know, I used used to work in Beijing. I used to work in Dubai and Abu Dhabi and broadcast and in Johannesburg and and in uh, in Amsterdam and in London. And you know, I think what what we need right now is black people. Um, especially in this part of America, is what we need right now is people who can be centered on the issues that impact us here in our region and very focused on it, and be able to deliver, um, to deliver it in in a real way. And so for me, it's Con- Converge's mission is very centered right here in the Pacific Northwest, and of course, mine's is as well. And, and it's like I said, it's a good feeling to come from that world, from that big world to this small local world, because by taking that route, I'm not lured lured away to be like, oh man, I need to go and be in this media market and do this or do that, you know, because I've already been there. Hmm. So then we, we obviously talking about some some huge huge topics. Um, listening, we talked about overcoming ignorance and bias, you know, the need for that, the optimism that I think you and I both share there. And then on the topic of taking action, like what can we do? You're wearing a shirt that says no excuses. How, how, how are you thinking about, this is obviously how you and I have got connected recently. How, how are you thinking about both yourself taking action, Converge taking action and, and, a, and a call to action for, for the community? Yeah, I mean, so so for us, I'll be honest with you, it's like, you know, we're hot right now. And like I said, hopefully we'll stay hot into perpetuity. Uh, but, you know, while we're here and while we're in this space, I'm always one of these people, I like to tell people, like, I'm not a gatekeeper. You know, I'm not, I'm not somebody who wants to keep everything for themselves. We got to shine. And I think that one of the biggest things going um that, that we can do is be able to create a space or environment to really bring some, some, I guess, equity even around the hiring, you know, how people, how people find jobs and even post jobs. I mentioned earlier here in the show that it's like I came home from all that experience and everything overseas and couldn't even get a job. People still in some algorithm, whatever it might have been, I don't know. Um, but it definitely wasn't my experience or skill set. They, they, they kept me from getting a job. And so one of the things we're doing is no excuses and no excuses, jobs.com. have an offshoot here, converge. Something just really, really on passionate about 
And No Excuses is really, it's a hiring platform, platform for, for people to, to find the post and find jobs. And it's all about like, it's more video, you know? And I mean, I think that somebody reading some whatever um, algorithm on, on, on a website about Omari Salisbury and somebody hearing me for one minute pitching who I am, you probably might get a different result. Hmm. Um, and, and so no excuses, jobs.com is really like that. And, and that's really, that's really like the, the truth, the realness, the swag, everything of what we're at right now in America, because it's like, especially around corporate America, it's like, okay, people, everybody's saying black lives matter and this and that and Jemima ain't and Jemima no more, you know, X, Y, and Z, all that's cool, but hire some black people. You know what I'm saying? Let's re- let's really. I'm for sustainable change. I'm from transformational. You know what I'm saying? So in 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 where we're missing from so many segments and sectors, and you got people, big captains in the industry saying there's not enough black qualified people out there and everything else. No excuses. We really come and aiming to kick in the door on that. Hmm. You know what I'm saying? And set the record straight. And, and be able to provide this pipeline of super exceptional uh, candidates over there into corporate America and, you know, not only change the narrative, but change the landscape, but also by doing so, man, you know what I'm saying? Giving, giving a, a, a pool of talent access that they never had before, you know? I mean, all these people, they, they, they ain't let me in the club. I had to, I mean, it's, it's messed up to say this, bro. But you know what? I had to get tear gas and pepper spray and shot with rubber bullets and still do my job in a professional manner to now be in the club, mm-hmm. to now be for all of these big businesses in Seattle. Be like, oh, my God, we'd love to have you work for us. Look what it took. Mm-hmm. I'm still the same guy. <laughs> it took all of that to play out live on international streaming, whatever, for me to sit there and get tear gas to get hit with rubber bullets, flashbangs blowing up upside my head. Now for the club to say, you're one of us. And so let me be the last sacrifice. Let me be the last one that that, something like that has to play out. Moving forward, let's be able to create this platform, noexcusesjobs.com, where someone ain't got to go through all of that for hiring managers to be like, okay, let me talk to you. Hmm. That's good. So any, any, any final words, you know, people listening on this, on this show are entrepreneurs, maybe they're, maybe they're a little younger or they're, they're investors. They're wondering how, how to help, how to actually make, make an impact with their time and their money. What, what, what words do you have for, for those audiences? All right. So for entrepreneurs, and this is real. I, I haven't personally reached the level of investor yet outside of small investor, but I do have a few things for that to, that I can give, especially for entrepreneurs. I think I got something to say here. Is like, man, you know, be be passionate and intentional about your work. And if you can't be passionate and intentional about it, it, it might not, it's not to say that entrepreneurship isn't for you, but it might be what you're doing. You know what I'm saying? Or just know, be able to create that timeline to be like, you know what? I don't want to be, you know, selling prepaid legal. That's not my ultimate goal, but this is where I'm started at here because it's going to teach me how to do sales, how to follow up with people, how to take rejection, how to be able to build whatever. You see what I'm saying? So, you know, I mean, but you got to know, you got to know where you're at. And, you know, it's this thing I talked about earlier. I read it in the book. It's not mine. KFC, kind of like the chicken spot, but like know what you want, find out what you're getting and change your approach until you get what you want. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, a a lot of times in entrepreneurship, we're not, we're not malleable enough unless the market makes us malleable. You know, when we be good, people tell us like, Hey, you might want to try this. You might be like, no, I'm good. I'm good. Until your money runs out. Then you'd be willing to try whatever. Please tell me, how can I, you know what I'm saying? You need to have some kind of, some kind of openness in that space and had a willingness to learn, but be there, but being passionate about your end goal is important. Cause like I said, you might enter into entrepreneurship 
not in the space where you're you're in goal. Not everybody walks through that door of like, man, I really want to own a computer company of X, Y, and Z. Like I said, you walk through that door and don't underestimate those initial doors and don't downplay them. Because those initial doors you might walk through might not necessarily be the straight line to where you want to be, but they teach you those life skills and they teach you those business skills that you might pull out your bag a decade later. You know, and they teach you those skills, like I said, about about rejection or teach you those skills about record keeping or teach you those skills about communicating with clients or, you know, or, 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 or things like that. And so many times people underestimate that. And, you know, those things are important. Um, and just know that even being in something that you're passionate about, something that you love, something you get up every day, it's just like, man, it's all right to fail. It's Man, it's, it's all right. It's scary kind of if you don't fail because you don't got no measurement to what success could really be. And, you know, I mean, man, we fail here. And I'll be honest with you, Will, it's like, man, we try. We do the best we can sometimes. It's in our control. Sometimes it's not something. We lose our signal. Sometimes, you know, it's our fault. Sometimes the internet company went down. Sometimes we just, you know, weren't able to cover something. But, you know, it's our ability to pick back up. I remember there was a council member here at the protest. It was a big the national story. Around. She didn't talk to nobody. but She was going to talk to us, Converge. I was like, this is a big deal. And, you know, trying to outdo myself, we were like, we're going to do the show live from her house. And it turns out the signal was bad. It was horrible. We had to drop the stream seven minutes into the interview. And, but we learned a lot. And that was a big failure. It was a big failure. But when you pick yourself up and then you learn, okay, this is what we can do. This is what we can do. But, you know, the flip side is we tried. And we tried, but we failed. But you pick yourself up. And I think in this fast food culture that we're in right now, man, this instant gratification, we got a lot of people who are entrepreneur track who feel like, you know, it needs to succeed immediately and everything else. My friends, I don't, man, I don't burn my fingers in so many places. You know what I'm saying? And there's, there, there's losses. I think most people could say there's losses and disappointments that you'll probably never speak of. You know what I'm saying? That that so impacted you that you'll keep it to yourself. But just know that that's out there. But that's you, you won't find no real success without that. And I'm not sitting here because I'm like you know head of like some some big TV cable organization or anything like that. And I'm not I'm not trying to talk like I'm you know head of CNN or or anything. But I am somebody who. Years ago, you know what I'm saying, had a vision of being like, man, how can, through video, how can I impact my community? And how can we make a difference? And so from that point, and growing up poor, growing up on food stamps, growing up on, you know what I'm saying, I only went to college because I only afforded it because I could play football, growing up with all these disappointments, being in 60 countries around the world and everything else, and to be here at Converge, I do feel like I'm the head of CNN. Not like in a cocky way, but because my journey has, has, has brought me to this point. And I know we got a long ways to go, but it's like I'm here and we're working, we're vibrant, we're in the space, these crazy people running around behind me. And, you know, it's because of getting out there, it's because of getting knocked down, it's because of getting back up and be like, you know, we're going we gonna to keep pushing. And for investor people, I would say this, Will, is like, you know, I mean, with money, everybody's like, you know, they're very diligent and, and like they're supposed to be. You work hard for it. Um, it's your money, you know. But I would just say this, right, is that like real serious investment people, if you got some real serious investment to to invest in people, there's a new class of entrepreneur and they might've always been out there, but it's a new class of entrepreneur who they don't, man, they don't speak your language, but that don't mean they can't make it happen. Mm. And a lot of times you find the investors get caught up with the people who are so well polished and they have read every book. Well, you know, we're talking to investors and it's this, this, and that, and whatever. And a lot of that stuff, you find a lot of stuff you investor classes investing in, that shit ain't moving. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It goes bust. It ain't happening. 
And here's a dude who's just, who's probably frustrated talking to you. You know what I'm saying? You show up as so-and-so is investing. He's like, man, I don't know what to say to this dude, man. This is whatever. And meeting is awkward because all this guy wants to do is get back in his workshop, right? Man, I would say that invest, man, you might need to like, you know, get you the translator. You know what I'm saying? Somebody who's the buffer in between who knows that it's like, because it is frustrating. Like even with us, and I'm open for investment, please. If you're investing, please please let me know. But because, you know, it'd be the hoops, you know, even with like the philanthropy stuff, it's like, yes, if you can pull out this 75 page application of what, like, man, whatever, I'll figure it out myself. Because the person used to man in the arena. You know what I'm saying? We all know the story. You win the arena. And what I've seen personally is I've just, I've seen investors come in and it's who's the well, the best polished and who's X, Y, and Z and everything else, man. And, and because a lot of people in the investor class, unless they came from really out the mud, they don't know how to really relate to that dude who's in the mud, but who, who's got a great idea and his business is functioning, but with some capital, it could blow up. They don't know how to communicate to him. The, he don't know how to communicate to the investor. And then investors usually move on to the people who's more well-polished, who usually haven't delivered anything, but it's all in their head. Mm. But the person who's out there every day on the grind can't get no capital. Because they don't know how to talk to the person who's coming in there, who's the investor. So, I mean, that's what that's what I see in real time. Is it's like, man, and the investor, the investor class might not change, and the, the entrepreneur might not change, but that leaves a space for people who can translate between the two. You know what I'm saying? To be like, ah, oh, you know what? I think you could probably do this, or you could probably do that. I mean, so that's my observation as far as you know, people. Who, who might have uh, the resources to invest. I like that. I appreciate that. So for those who have heard, listened, watched to this, and they're interested in helping out, you converge besides going to noexcusesjobs.com. We'll put the links in the show notes here. How can they help? How can they help you? How can they help converge? All right. I'm, I'm glad you asked. You know what I'm saying? We, we are the epitome of grassroots independent media and you know what I'm saying we we really um are able to to uh, survive and at times thrive because of the public and literally keep the lights on here because of the public so you know what I'm saying if 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 you've heard it converge in our work and you want to support or if you find that this interview is compelling and you want to support the work that we're doing here I would encourage you go to where we converge, just like it sounds, where we converge dot com um, forward slash donate. And you know what I'm saying? You could donate there. Like one time, it's like people, sometimes people they donate like three dollars, two dollars, and they're like, yo, man, it's all I got. And it's it's mad, like touching to see that. And some people they go and they subscribe. You might there's a Patreon link is there as well. People subscribe for a whole year and some of everything else. And I just want to tell people, it's like, man, you know, we definitely, it's just society we live in. We definitely need cash donations to keep things going here. But man, I'll be honest with you, covering the protests and really being in some dire situations there has made me a firm believer that like, man, we're also open for prayers and good vibes too. So, you know what I'm saying? Somebody might be watching this and they like, damn, man, I, I don't spend all my money, you know what I'm saying, trying to do whatever because I know what it is. It's hard living out here. So you might not got no money right now, but, you know, just know that, like, because we be out there in the protest, we cover a lot of dangerous situations. Man, our people, these guys ain't got no health insurance, you know what I'm saying? They ain't got this and that, and it be people's prayers, I swear to God, and, and a positive vibe that it kept us safe. So we open for that, too. <laughs> That's wonderful. Well, thank you, Amari. And, and, and I'm curious for those that, that are business owners, are you accepting uh, and, and taking on sponsors for your, for your programming right now? Is that, is that open for business or how are you thinking about that? Yes, we, we, so we are, and you know, I mean, every, every broadcaster has its limitations or, or whatever, but we have the morning update show, which um, right emanates from Seattle every, every uh, Monday through Friday, 11 to 12 PM. And you can find it across all Converge 
uh, media platform. It's a big deal out here. You know, you you tune in, you find the mayor, you find the county executive, the city council, community members. You know what I'm saying? It's we. I think you were the one who said this. We are here punching above our weight class, Will. And so it's a it's a great show, great platform. We got a bunch of other shows as well. So you know what I'm saying? If 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 you have a brand or if you have a message, man, hit us up. Love it. All right, Amari, really appreciate your time. Thank you, Will. Thank you for having me. All right, a couple quick things before you go. Number one, I have a general newsletter where I write about technology and startups and health science and teaching people to code. And I write about a variety of different subjects that we talk about on this show. So if you go to wclittle.com, there you'll be able to subscribe and you'll also be able to subscribe to particular topics. If you're just interested in one or a few of them, you'll be notified right when I publish new content in those areas. Number two, my partners and I at Proto Ventures have a portfolio company called Startup Rocket. If you go to startuprocket.com, there you'll be able to receive coaching guides and customize an operations framework for you and your team and your advisors to be on the same page in terms of what is the appropriate next step for you and your entrepreneurial journey. And finally, if you wouldn't mind leaving a review anywhere that you have listened to this podcast or watched this podcast, it would be super helpful to help those who might be interested in consuming this content as well. Thank you.